Yeah, so we're going to switch gears to harmonic analysis now. Uh, we're going to have a geometric flavor. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can do in 15 or 20 minutes. My goal is to uh, introduce decoupling. It's a relatively new field um, that everyone in the audience may be familiar with it, uh, or at least the current recent trends. Uh, and then uh, considering that same line of thought, I'd like to also uh, motivate a little bit um, why we should especially care about decoupling in terms of um, very powerful applications of this method that have been used across a number of different disciplines within math. Uh, okay. So, so we're all familiar with the syntax. I wanted to provide some notation, the usual abbreviation for the complex value uh, exponential function. And uh, skipping down to the fourth point, uh, this would be key to keep track of the theorems that will be presented, um, or just key results that won't necessarily be presented in a theorem format in order to save time. Uh, but the Fourier projection is a key object of focus throughout this talk. And I think the, the rest is notational um, familiar with it. Okay, uh, so given a function f, uh, Schwartz function f that we are going to think of as a wave because both Fourier, uh, the Fourier transform and Fourier inversion can be applied to f. Uh, we may seek information about f by studying the composite waves whose frequencies lie within small regions. Essentially, we are just doing a function decomposition in terms of the various Fourier projections. Um, and of course, it's well known for quite some time that in the Rome Bell 2, uh, we just take the usual square integral. Uh, there is this square root cancellation. Uh, in this case, uh, it's an exact equality that we have. And for us, this was sort of our first step um, in sort of uh, mathematics, recent mathematics, uh, towards determining the amount of cancellation that occurs when you take waves of varying frequencies and uh, allow them to, to interact or you superimpose them. Um, and what's key for L2, that will not be uh, true will not be valid for the cases that we want to consider uh, is that all you need is for the frequencies to be different. But it will be very important that we take uh, frequencies that follow some nice geometric pattern, which will be explained in more detail shortly. So let me try to generalize, let me try to generalize Pancharov's uh, equality identity to arbitrary LP norms. And initially we have this proposition obtained by the usual interpolation between Pancharov's identity and the L infinity estimate that holds trivially. Uh, this inequality is called trivial decoupling in the decoupling literature. And this is a point that I was wanting to hint at just a few minutes ago, that this inequality is sharp if the SIs are essentially arranged along some line. And so, and then uh, there's additional specifications that need to be made. But in general, for decoupling results, we have to avoid lines, at least if we are considering L2 decoupling, uh, and L2 will be uh, this inequality with R replaced by two. Uh, or more formally, uh, here is the definition of LR, LP decoupling. And the key point here is that instead of the previous factor that we had, which was capital N to the one minus one over P minus one over R, uh, it's been reduced to one half minus one over R, which is strictly a strict loss in the exponent uh, for R larger than two. And the relevant values of R will be either two or P, uh, or either scenario will refer to as L2 or LP decoupling. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so recently, uh, about eight or seven years ago, John Bergain and Chipper and Demeter provided the first optimal L2 coupling theorem. Uh, let me first interpose that uh, Wolf was the one to formally introduce the coupling um, further back uh, around 2001. And he produced uh, results, uh, LP decoupling in the range of P larger than 74 for the comb. Bergain and Demeter uh, were aware of this paper and they found the arguments that were made there for the comb to be valid as well for the paraboloid. There are similarities in the geometry of these two apparently different objects. Uh, but what Wolf did not have, unfortunately, at his time was the multilinear techniques that became um, very, very helpful uh, at, upon the discovery of Bennett, Carver, and Tell. And uh, by combining these multilinear techniques with the various scale-based arguments that Wolf uh, pioneered in his work, 
they're able to provide this fully optimal L2 decoupling theorem for the parabola, which was a giant leap uh, concerning advances in this new theory. Um, so note that P has to be between two and the sine to mass index. This is uh, famous from restriction theory. But uh, one more statement before moving on. Concerning exponential sums, uh, there was an initial bound provided for exponential sums uh, where the frequencies are taken within an n, n minus one dimensional paraboloid. Uh, the previous bound provided was given by the Stein to mass L2 restriction theorem. Um, but decoupling beats the bound provided by that theorem by a factor of R minus one over two P, highly non-trivial, not just because it's non-zero or dependent upon R, but it actually gives us the sharp inequality when we are taking the integral over the ball, the ball of the specified radius. <laughs> okay, so indeed establishing the coupling for the paraboloid was a giant leap concerning the theory because the paraboloid is a very nice shape in terms of the fact that it models very large class of surfaces. Uh, doesn't necessarily represent all the non-degenerate hypersurfaces, but it does represent those hypersurfaces that have positive principal curvatures. Um, it's a fancy way of saying that if you take any graph that is at least C3 and you look at the second degree part of the Taylor expansion um, and you diagonalize that, then all your coefficients for that, uh, those second degree terms are going to be positive values, positive numbers. Um, if they're just non-zero numbers, then we call such a graph non-degenerate. So what's left is the case of vanishing curvature, uh, with the exception of the n-dimensional cone, which Organic Donor took care of. And this is where my research has been focused. So initially, uh, in joint work with Brigand and Demeter, we proved decoupling for the real analytic surfaces of revolution and R3. Uh, then next, the decoupling theory of developable surfaces in R3 was uh, completed. Concerning the third point, the surface may seem rather strange, but it actually models the convex two-dimensional hypersurfaces of finite line type. Um, and this is based upon a decomposition provided by Schultz. Uh, and we'll speak a little bit more upon that in just a little while. And in recent work that is uh, near completion, the rule of hypersurfaces and our end generated by a curve also have an established L2 decoupling theory. Okay, so I didn't necessarily want to provide the theorems because they look pretty technical uh, when it's your first time seeing them. Uh, I think providing a pictorial representation uh, it's a good first step towards uh, understanding the nature of these theorems. Um, if you can recall the decoupling theorem for the paraboloid, which we'll go back to that. I may not have allowed you all enough time with this slide. Uh, notice that we are taking the horizontal plane just for the usual paraboloid, um, C1 squared plus C2 squared all the way up to CM minus one squared. Um, and if you want, you can put coefficients in front of these uh, positive values, I'll say approximately one. Um, then you want to divide the horizontal plane into squares, essentially. Uh, we can say that delta to the one half is an a reciprocal of an integer. Um, but the key point here is that all of your uh, subsets downstairs that correspond to subsets in the actual graph they all look square-like. They all are roughly the same, just maybe rotated and translated. However, in the non-degenerate case, or rather in the degenerate case, uh, this no longer applies. You can see that the shapes are varying in terms of their dimensions. Um, at the top of the torus, this is, by the way, a picture of part of the torus. At the top of the torus, uh, that is a curve where the normal vector does not vanish, or sorry, the normal vector does not change direction along the curve. Um, so it represents points on the torus where there is some principal curvature that is zero. And as you get close, as our 
uh, if uplane partition caps get close to that curve, you can see that the length is getting increasingly larger. Uh, and it's because essentially uh, two dimensional geometry begins to dominate as you get close to that top curve. Whereas away from the curve, it does matter that the torus is actually three dimensional because it starts to curve. Um, but at the top, it's, it fits within a horizontal plane, uh, the intersection of the torus with, uh, um, let's say, a plane of C3 equals one. Okay, so moving to applications. Um, this list is far from complete. I just merely wanted to provide uh, the results, uh, maybe some of the well known canonical heavy hitters, if you will. Uh, so, the point wise convergence of Schrodinger solutions uh, was an open problem for quite some time. And then it was solved via decoupling by Du and Zhang. Uh, Bourgain provided a new upper bound for the Riemann zeta function on the critical line. So it's a number theory application. Uh, and of course, there is the well-known application to Vinogradov's mean value theorem, uh, which uh, was also independent, independently proven by Trevor Woolley. Uh, here, uh, so concerning the uh, decoupling proof, uh, Guth, Demeter, and uh, sorry, forgetting the third, I think Wayne, uh, were the ones to provide decoupling for the Vinagrata mean value theorem via a decoupling method. Um, and then uh, Wang is also one of the authors on the last bullet point where progress towards the faculty distance set conjecture uh, was secured. Okay, uh, there are significant connections between restriction theory and decoupling theory. Um, in fact, uh, see, and work, recent work of Benjamin Bruce and Betsy Stovall, they are able to use decoupling for the restriction theory of negatively curved surfaces in R3. Um, let's make sure I'm not fixing something. Yes, and uh, this also has appeared in work on maximal averages too, um, relating to non-degenerate curves. Uh, but let me explain the conjectures here. Uh, the first one deals with restriction theory for the hypersurface that is generated by a non-degenerate curve. So you're just taking some phi whose first uh, n derivatives form a matrix with uh, non-zero determinant uh, at every t value. And we just expand along the, those lines um, provided by the directions of the various derivatives of phi. Uh, I have reason to believe that small cap decoupling should hold for this surface. And if it does, it would imply the restriction conjecture for M. In the same way that it's known that the small cap decoupling for the paraboloid would provide restriction for the paraboloid. Um, the full range. Uh, and this is because of the more indication factorization. Um, and then small cap decoupling makes the argument boil down to a nice application of Young's inequality at the end of the day, because you are reducing your probability to a small enough scale, um, a uniform scale, in fact, for all the various dimensions. And uh, right, I'm a little bit out of uh, sequence, I forgot to mention one important thing. So this is my last slide, but let me uh, interpose with one more point about decoupling uh, for degenerate surfaces. Forgot to mention something very important, which is that um, concerning the degenerate smooth surfaces, uh, hypersurfaces, which is the overall goal, we want to be able to show that any smooth hypersurface um, that is not just a hyperplane has an, an L2 decoupling or LP decoupling theory. And this has been secured actually in R equals three. Well, it's already true in R equals two by work of Demeter um, and Borgan, of course. But Li and Yang, uh, just this past year uh, or last year actually, provided a proof in the three dimensional setting. And their philosophy uh, is a bit different from uh, the philosophy that uh, 
it's a bit different from my approach. Um, they use polynomial dependent methods. Um, and that uh, is very, very clever, um, their, their use of these uh, techniques. And they provide a very nice theorem that uh, goes beyond um, just having an analytic manifold to a smooth uh, graph or smooth manifold. But uh, the way that um, I sort of uh, examine decoupling for these surfaces uh, follows procedure given by Kramnik and Zieger, where uh, you want to use scale-based iteration or also known as induction on scales. And I've been looking for generalizations of this method. And when this has worked, uh, the bounds are not dependent upon polynomial degree. Okay, so moving on to our last slide. There is, uh, you may be familiar with the Balkan Reese problem for the paraboloid. Uh, it can be formulated for general convex domains. And this problem was actually solved um, concerning uh, Balkan Reese between, concerning the second bullet point, Balkan Reese between uh, one and the side Tomas index. That was proven by work of uh, Yosevich, Sawyer, and Seeger. Um, and they provided partial results for dimension n larger than or equal to four. But in, in dimension uh, n equals three, they, they solve this entirely. Um, I do have an alternate proof of that same theorem using decoupling uh, because of a result that was previously shown to you where decoupling for this model surface of the two-dimensional convex hypersurfaces was obtained. Um, but what's needed when you move entire dimensions is something that takes the Schultz decomposition of convex functions and shapes them into something nice, uh, such as what we have in the three-dimensional setting. This is not too bad to handle um, for iterative decoupling methods. It's really just, so I never figured out at this, okay, it does point. I never figured, uh, so right, so this term here, um, is the one that causes problems. Uh, the reason why is higher order terms, they, they vanish by some inductive hypothesis. Uh, and then even this term, as well as this term, can also be made to vanish for our considerations because of the fact that you have this principal curvature here, this coefficient one, which in particular is rounded away from zero. But A is allowed to be small. A can be anything. And so terms that involve C1 and don't have too high a degree, namely this term right here, would be the only one to pose a problem. Um, but there's a nice trick that you can apply uh, where you are able to circumvent the obstacle posed by that term and produce a legitimate L2 decoupling inequality. And then Bok and Reese for our limited range follows right away. But in four dimensions and higher, it's not clear how we can how I can um, how we can obtain such a nice reduction for general convex hypersurfaces. So I think with this I will conclude. Great, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? Uh, I'm Peter. Can I ask a question? Yes, I would like to also correct something. I, I attributed the Vinograd of mean value theorem to Regain Demeter Wang, but it, uh, or Demeter Goof Wang is for Regain Demeter Goof. Yes. Uh, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> uh, can you maybe uh, clarify what your theorem in higher dimensions is, where you have a curve, uh, your higher dimensional version, uh, a degenerate case? Uh, conjecture one. Uh, or the no, theorem. No, the theorem you have proved. Okay. Yes. Um, right. So it's an L2 uh, LP inequality, which means that it looks. Uh, I like guess I'm asking what the hypersurface you're generating in high dimensions is special. I just am trying to understand what it is. So you go back to that bottom uh, bullet of your theorem. 
you know, recently, recently, uh, so what ruled hypersurfaces generated by, can you just explain what that means? Oh, sure. Uh, it's going to be the image of this map here, where if he has any uh, non-degenerate real valued, or sorry, a non-degenerate function mapping from a closed interval. Okay, okay. Right, um, and, and the reason why we would care about such a surface is that it's a nice uh, introduction to the general class of zero curvature hypersurfaces um, for higher dimensions, higher values of them. Okay, I got it, thanks. So it's better than who we have many co-dimensions uh, linear subspaces. Sorry, one more time. It's better than who would contain many co-dimension two linear subspaces. This surface yes, you're saying it can contain. Be. For me, who is only many lines, bigger dimensional flat pieces. Right, 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 right. That is the idea. Yes. Um, Yes, in fact, for every fixed value of t, you just have a parallelogram, mm -hmm. and that parallelogram is uh, changing in its shape and position. All right, uh, thank you very much.